So this is the uh, the last yes. of the series of works of hi. The last of uh, of th this series um, that uh, Kyber's gotten to do with Whole Sound. Um, which is sad, but it's been really cool. And we will do more workshops with Whole Sound in 2022. So that's uh, cool stuff to look forward to. Um, yeah, like I love the idea of like uh, harmony in nature or like harmony just in, in the way things are. Um, And so, I mean, yeah, when we, when we, like, when I wanted to do these workshops on just, like, the basics of sound, um, uh, like, I, I think, like, in, in a lot, like, it's often, or, like, music's, it, like, often, like, thought of as separated into, like, rhythm, melody, and harmony, right? And so, like, those things kind of all build upon each other. There's, like, rhythm melody and harmony and um yeah like and so that's kind of like what uh like how i wanted to build like this whole series because like do you remember like like okay so first thing i kind of want to do which i kind of want everybody to get in on if you guys are game is to just like go over like what are the discoveries that we've made right like the question that we're asking is like, what is sound? What, like, what is it? What is sound? We just want to leave with like a little bit more of an understanding about why there is sound, like why we hear it, why it's going on around us. And like, why would we want to dis differentiate between like rhythm and melody and anything like that? So I guess the like first question that I have related to that is like, Yeah, like what is, um, like, does anybody want to, to, to like talk about the difference between like the difference or similarity between rhythm and pitch or like rhythm and melody? First, did Lily want to speak or was that an accident? I'm not sure I saw a raised hand there. Thanks. Yeah, I just, um, there was just something that struck me about what you said about like why, why sound. And then I had this thought and I was like, well, it's just why we know it in this way is so that we can, we can experience. It's all just levels of experience. Thank you. Yeah. I, I've been kind of tripping out before even doing this w workshop today because like just thinking about this like whole thesis statement of why we why doing this you know is to try to deal with the fact that like what is agreement w like what is reality like what is really going on and the fact that we have to actually furnish that with sensation and that the sensation has to come from experience or else we're like dealing with illusion. And that's like actually what we're dealing with. And it's a really problem. It's a huge problem. Like even having great accountability tools and tools to sort yourself out, like how the fuck do we know what's going on? <laughs> and yeah, like there's this really, this thing that Jerry said to me and it really fucked my head up and I couldn't believe it. Um, and it's just that like sound comes from reality, you know, that it doesn't come from imagination, that it comes from reality. Lily, did you raise your hand? Well, just because in that moment of also celebrating that it's experience, I'm like so aware of how like it's exclusionary to say, just to, to say it in that way about sound and not embody these other things about experience. Cause I think about my deaf friends and I'm like, okay, sound is experience, but my deaf friends have taught me and showed me so much about experience. Right. And how like I, um, 
how I favor like sounding and sound. Right. So it's like I, two sides of the same thing, right? So yeah. I just kind of wanted to share. Oh, that's a, a beautiful observation too. And also, I mean, the interesting thing about not being able to hear sound with your ears, like it's interesting because it really is vibration in space. And like the vibration that you feel below your feet, if you feel the ground rumble, like it's just happening on a higher frequency. And that's like what we're calling sound. But that actually like we are experiencing everything that we call sound with every other bit of sensation. And it's the same privileging that, that Lily's talking about where we're like privileging that hearing. But, and then part of, again, what we're trying to do when we're thinking about like, what is sound? We're just trying to like actually touch base with reality for a sec. Cause when we hear sounds and we hear music, we're like in this world that's like full of wonder and imagination. And it's like a great world, right? We like think all these things. But there's also this world that's like actually as embodied as like being hit in the face, you know? And I don't know why, like, I don't know, maybe, honestly, this is what I was tripping out about this week. I was like, does me thinking that there's a difference, like, am I actually losing it? Like, is there even? Like, am I, like, is there a world where I'm getting hit in the face and that's like something, like, that I'm working with? here like privileging that over top of the world that we are all creating but the one thing I always keep coming back to with this sound thing is like there is agreement in one version of the world that we seem to all share right <laughs> like, like not in a lot of ways and then I'm just like wondering what we could get with music. I'm like wondering where we could get to with this idea of thinking so deeply about sound, if we can start to kind of put it back into the reality. Um, wait, sorry. And then Ryan, did you feed this thing in the chat, but I didn't. Yeah, Ryan said in the chat, with regard to the distinction between rhythm and sound, uh, something neat is that rhythm requires the absence of sound. And then they say, super obvious, but I just realized it, LOL. Wait, wait, can you say that again? Oh, sure. It says, with regard to the distinction between rhythm and sound, something neat is that rhythm also requires the absence of sound. Right. Totally. Yeah, which is true, but you don't really think about it that way. Like, for it to even exist, you need for nothing to be there. Yeah, I mean, and it's... Yeah, it's so cool, especially with clapping or like, like setting up those kinds of things. There's like an on or an off, like, like there is actually kind of a binary quality to it. And I mean, this is like actually kind of I, 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 I find that observation so cool, because it's coming kind of back to that question of when we say like, what is a wave? Like, remember that we're like really kind of building all of this work off of this question, like, what is a wave? And um, so when you clap, what is that wave? When there is rhythm, what is that wave? Right? Um, and uh, so, like there, like, so for example, like if we're clapping like this, we like hear that moment where there's sound and then we hear the gap where there's no sound. But then there's also actually something happening in the gap as well where there's no sound, which is like the bottom half of the curve where the like potential is increasing again, like where the hands are coming closer to again. And so it, it's actually cool that we like in nature see all these waves that, that like have that kind of because the wave that is a clap that has the gap in it would be like a square wave, right? Where it's like on and then it's off. Um, and then how that like sews back in to this other kind of wave that like squiggly wave we were looking at um, is 
is yeah that there's like a gradation right between like on or off loud or soft sound or no sound because it's also really interesting too like I, I just thought of it when you said no sound that like we even kind of talked about this in one of the ones, these classes before, like about the rooms that they set up, those like sound free rooms. But it's actually really interesting, like what is no sound, you know? Because there is almost kind of no bottom place. And then even when we're thinking about rhythm as a listening exercise, right? Uh, like, can you hear rhythmic cycles around you? in the room that you're in right now. And it's really cool to be able to like maybe differentiate between those rhythmic cycles that seem to have like the gray scale between them where they go like wow 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 versus the ones that are like for example that are like more sharper between on and off um it is um you know you said example one like wow 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 that as a sound like is um just like is that this just a variation of that exactly yeah and this is coming back to what we were talking about in that first class again too about like what is a wave you know like, if I draw a straight line, is it a wave? Like, unless it's, the only way it's not a wave is if it's completely, perfectly straight. But if it have, has even a little bit of a bend to it, right? Like, so like when we were drawing waves that look like this. So that, uh, and we're like, yeah, this is a wave. But then what if I like zoomed in on a certain part of the wave so that it kind of looked like this, right? Is that a wave? No. And then if it can like flatten itself out a little bit more, like wow, see, like I can't, obviously I can't draw it flat. But then even still, so like wherever I don't draw it flat, which would have been right here, we see that there's information that implies this like low frequency wave in here. And then so the only difference between the like and the wow 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 would be what? The frequency. And so this is where and then again like remember that we had like we realized that there's only like actually two pieces of information that we needed to describe the wave. One is called amplitude. And then the second is called frequency. And that like in any wave, in any kind of repeating pattern, the amplitude is just talking about like how different this is from this, how different the top is from the bottom. That's amplitude. And then the frequency is just like asking like how separated these repeating parts are. And then do you remember the thing that we like kind of realized about pitch then? was that like the lowest frequency that you can hear is 20 hertz. Which means that like 20 hertz is like hearing a clicking sound 20 times a second. So if you could click 20 times a second, you would actually hear a low pitch. And then if you could click like 100 times a second, you would actually start to hear a slightly higher pitch. So in that way, we've come to realize like that was like a pretty big takeaway for me in this, in the last sort of thing that we did was like the idea that rhythm and pitch are like actually the same thing. Oh, Cleo, you asked a question. Okay. Oh yeah, frequency. Yeah, so the frequency would be like related to the separation on the x-axis and on the y-axis. 
uh, it would be like the amplitude would be, yeah, would be on the y-axis. Oh, but you're talking about that other graph that we saw last week? On that other graph, actually, like, yeah, the x-axis shows the distribution of frequencies. And the, um, like, the height of those bars shows the distribution of amplitude of like how much power was in each of those bars. Um, I think I have a quick question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you, I was really um, interested in knowing more about what was mentioned in the first one about how from this like agreement of resonating the same pitch with someone or being in time with someone, like was the way that people were able to discover like number systems or at least like create that kind of standard because there was there was something you said about that being like kind of how it how it went yeah well i mean really like it kind of has to do with um You know, honestly, the the easiest answer to this, although I feel like I'm just going to spit it out to me, is the fact that, the, like, oh, you know what? This is a perfect time to answer this question based on what we were talking about. You remember this question, like, is it a wave? The number system. Is it a wave? Like, if I'm telling you a wave is something that goes like this, right? So I'm like... I don't know. Here you go. One. I can keep going. You guys have seen that before. Like, you know what numbers look like. I'm not going to do it, but like, uh, but like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It almost looks like it's two waves. Like one starts where your yellow one started and the other one starts at 10 and it's the two. first, the first digit and it's slower it gets it goes up slowly every single piece on the multiplication table is a different wave on the number line look because there could be 10 right and that or that wait that, that that's eight you see that that's eight and it would go eight then it would go through 16 and then it would go through 24 every different n times table is a wave of a different frequency on the number line. That's how essential harmony, this is how essential vibration and frequency is to the natural order of nature and the relationships between all things. The number line is a wave. And in fact, it shows you the fractal nature of waves is that on a single pattern being the number line, you can actually have every single wave you could conceive of overlaid on top of it. <laughs> and just there in the times tables, you can see the intersection points of all the waves. Is that cool? Yeah, we're losing our friggin' marbles uh, over here. Holy. Holy. This week had helped a lot of high school kids in math when I did this one. Mm -hmm. I was so anxious in math class. Now I'm not. <laughs> I know. I know. This is... And then, so, yeah. And and then, again, this comes back to the question of, like, how did people being able to, to sing together, like, help people to begin to sort these kinds of things out? Because, actually, what you'll notice is if you sing two notes in tandem like you'll feel it resonate and become one single thing. Like you feel unity, you feel unity. And then as those notes come apart, you can feel beating begin, right? And depending on how separated those two different notes are, you'll feel different cycles of beating, right? And so is anybody confused about what I mean when I say beating? Cause I'm kind of, like I hate saying it because I find it confusing as heck. Well, I never heard it called that before, but I know what you mean by saying it. Right, and like, how would you describe it if you had to describe it in some way? Not to put you on the spot, but like, you know what I mean. The grinder. 
Yeah. There's like another cycle that's kind of conflicting with the first cycle. Yeah. And the, that cycle is getting shorter or longer, it gets further apart or closer. You are to be in tune. Yeah, and let's see if we can just do this fun thing where we look at stuff again, because I loved doing this last time. That was, this was fun. Okay. So, do we remember this from last time? Oops, sorry. This. How we could, like, look at this wave up here. And that what this is telling us is, like, where... So, that note was a B note, right? And so what this is telling us is that all of the energy here is like concentrated where in this in 251 hertz, right? And then so what I know too is if I recorded this sound, um, I would... I would see a wave. There it is. And the number of times that this wave would oscillate is 251 times in a second. How do I know that? Because of... Um, Because when I hit play here, there we go. Two hundred. Well, yeah. Now it's a good one. Two hundred and ninety-six. I must have hit a different note. <laughs> uh, but and then so that's what we see in here, right? So we know that that wave. It tells us how many little like vibrations. And then up here we see that like way down, there's much less energy. There's all these other scattered little harmonics that kind of fit into there. And then if and that's if we look at this like computer generated note. And then remember when we actually decided we were gonna look at like a a violin note instead. We saw that it wasn't just one note. We're not just one frequency in there but actually that there's all these other frequencies combined with that single note that are like creating this one note that we're hearing on the violin, right? And you guys remember what we called these other things? These were the harmonics. Sorry, I don't want to make you guys like talk on Zoom. I'm trying, like it's so weird, like teaching on the internet. I don't know how anybody did it. But, like, I know you're there. Like, I trust it. It's just, like, usually when you're in a room, it's, like, so easy to talk to people. Um, but, oh, yeah, okay, the harmonic. And then we know, remember, like, we looked at the other wave, too, where we recorded that violin sound and shit. Like, I don't care. I'll do it. Sure, I can do it. Hit play there. And I hit a note. Okay. And then we go back and look at this note that we just recorded here. And we see that, yeah, it's not just like one wave form. We see that there's like all kinds of waveforms intersecting in there. And remember when we were talking about beating? Like, look at this. It's like womp, 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 you know? And, like, the waves actually start to gather in these, like, little clusters. And actually, too, like, if I go back to that uh, synthetic instrument that I was using, we can hear there's one note, right? And so now I'm going to play another note. And can you see what's happening in between them? Right there. So that's where the two notes are combining. And they're like actually interfering with each other. 
and creating like the presence of what appears to be another note like coming in and out of focus in the middle and so like if i do three notes at a time and then actually the lower i go the more strongly that that beating will happen and actually if i pitch those notes closer together you can hear it right how the two notes are like fighting with each other like watch how that little bobble in the middle matches how the sound of the fighting is happening can you see that those are two notes that are very close together let's go up higher with two notes close together So still a lot of fighting. And um, so what I wanted to us to see was like how like again on those synthetic notes like what happens when the two notes get put together and then now we're going to listen to that same thing again but with the violin notes I'll go in here okay so one note sound like this and then now we're going to look for the beating with two notes. And now obviously it's like a little bit hard to tell using this violin sample that I'm using because there's already a bit of vibrato in the notes themselves. But the big thing that I'm trying to, I kind of want to try to get at here is, okay, so like the big breakthrough that I wanted us to have from the beginning of this was that rhythm and pitch are like ultimately the same thing, right? Pitch is just really, really fast rhythm. And so since we know that melody is a combination of pitches and, and melody is pitch which is rhythm then melody and rhythm we see how those two things are actually like deeply connected so then the next question is this thing called harmony right which is what we're moving on to and in music and music theory how harmony works is harmony are like is like the other notes that your melody note is related to so that it actually makes sense to you like what's going on and so but the thing that i want to look back at here on this violin sound is that anytime i play this one note i'm actually hearing all of these distinct frequencies combined right like we believe that because we saw it on the waveform and now we're seeing it again in the spectrum and we're seeing those peaks so like i feel like it kind of like i mean this is just physics and reality but like if one single pitch contains every single other pitch then what is the difference between melody and harmony what is actually the difference between one note and two notes because now watch this actually like shit i really do mean this like i really mean this and this is mind-blowing if you can really see it we're gonna this is one note okay this is two notes If you didn't know that those were two notes and you could only tell by looking at the screen, could you tell they were two notes? What do you want from me? 
Like, this is crazy, isn't it? What is harmony? Combination of notes. Pardon? Combination of notes or a melody that's spatial instead of temporal. I know, but it's interesting. So, like, I like the combination of notes. I dig it. If it's a combination of notes, though, like, if I go, oh, that's a combination of notes. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And again, the only thing I'm trying to hopefully do here is like let everybody know that this shit is way easier than anybody's like making you think it is. Like, it's like, just a new sound. Pardon? It's just like a new sound altogether. Like just like one one solid sound on the same level as uh, just an A or an A plus a B or whatever we all. Know. Yo. And now check out that. It's like the slightest flip, but it's actually really heavy. So remember how we hear harmony? It's like, oh, that's two sounds together. Yo, shit, there's no such thing as two sounds together. No, I mean it. Like, there's actually no such thing. <laughs> like, there's just the whole sound. You know? <laughs> it's no, it's really like... That's like, this is what we've been talking about. Like, Kelly, you just graduated. I'm sorry. Like, you, Nick, just got the, you just got the award. Nick, what I like to think about is that there's a sound field. Like, you've got all of space. And at every point in space, there's a different, like, wave, which is the combination of all the sounds traveling from all the directions around it through that point that's that's certainly more accurate than than yeah yeah no that is quite accurate i guess that's really quite accurate it's interesting like but then it, it but like do we it's like and and the goal here isn't just to like sit us with truths from science so that we can have them necessarily but to really recognize that, like, when we combine sounds, we're making one sound. And actually, like, anytime I'm combining a sound with another sound, really what I'm doing, really, oh. is just, like, mixing the one sound. I'm just like ex accentuating certain parts of it and not other parts of it. And then when does the sound begin and end? Okay. And when does the sound have one sound, more or less sounds to it? Okay. I mean, like, these are the ways in which we absolutely girdle ourselves when we create sound artwork. I swear to God, we all do it. Like, it's impossible not to. You're like, yeah, and then this is going to have this section, and this is going to have this, and this is all this stuff. No doubt. You have to do it to make the stuff. But then we're like, we're seeing that we're not really dealing with reality when we're doing that. And it's not necessarily a problem. But it is kind of interesting, isn't it? Like, like even the sensation of being able to perceive these different sounds in a sound recording, is that really what's going on as well? Like there's actually so much judgment and mental, like our brains are so incredible at picking apart these patterns. Like our minds are so, like shit, like you can actually blend all these sounds together so that they're really only one sound and there's only one wave. But you can hear the drums, bass, the guitar, the saxophone, like all these things distinctly. Even though they do truly, truly make one sound together. And then part of this other really amazing thing that comes from this harmony shit as well is that I'm going to try this, like I'll go like this, like. Um, how do I put this? Um, okay, so give us one note here. I'll give us a C. Okay? 
And so this spectrum thing, it's telling us where all of our, uh, where all of the peaks in this wave are, right? And so the very first peak I see there, it's a C, right? Like I told you it was. And what's the frequency there? It's like 200 and 63 hertz, so like roughly 260 hertz, okay? So if I go to the next peak that I get from that, it's also a C. Okay, crazy. And if I look at the frequency, what do I notice? 522 hertz, which is double, exactly double what this first one was. So the very first harmonic that you get is always going to be double of the very first note right? And then the thing that I really want us to actually start to check out is what happens right here. Is there any comments on this peak from all you music freaks? Anybody want to go for it? I mean, I think then it becomes to, to, to instead of double, like maybe like half double up from there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Look, because, right, you got like 250 roughly, right? And then you're pretty much at 500. And then you're at like 750 and a bit. Right? You see how they're spaced like that? 750 and a bit. Shit, that one's at a thousand. Like they really, it's really, that's what, it's really happening like this. And like, what is each harmonic actually? It's just what happens when you double it, triple it, quadruple it. Just the wave that you had, the first wave that you had. It's the same thing that I'm talking about with the number line. Like, like the, the multiplication tables are the harmonics of the number line. Harmonics are just showing you what the factors of the sound are. You know? So what this is telling you is that the sound has a big C in it, and then the sound has made up of another C. But then actually what's crazy is that if you triple it, the next thing that you get is a G. And so what do we know about the relationship of the G to the C? Fifth. Yeah, it's this thing in music called a fifth. And so I can, I'm just gonna, I just took like a quick little notice of who's around here. And like, I do believe that we're all like semi familiar with music, the piano. So, like, is there anyone who doesn't know what a fifth is? Me. Awesome. Okay, actually, that's wicked. And again, like, all that really we mean. As you can tell, I mean, this is a way fucking better way to learn what a fifth is. I wish so badly that instead of being told that it was the fifth note of a scale, which it's not, like, it doesn't help because you don't know what a scale is yet. So, like, how are you going to find the fifth note in it? Yo, the fifth is the first note that happens in any note that is not the root note itself. It's the first truly distinct harmonic. Why does it come after the second C instead of between the first and the second C? I mean, like, I don't want... The real true answer is that that is between us and literally the creator of the universe, you know? <laughs> like, this is nature. Like, this is a spectrum, and the spectrum is just showing you where the energy is located in the sound of a violin. Like, I don't. Like, the honest to God truth is that, like, but, each but one it's, of these... it's unique to the violin, you know, this, it, this violin path. You know, the only thing that is unique to this violin is the amount to yep. which these harmonics show up. But these harmonics, this is called the harmonic series. In my voice, I mean, I showed this last class, like, in my voice, the harmonics will show up in the exact mm -hmm. same order. 
The only yeah. difference between my voice and the violin is the mix of the harmonics. Mm -hmm. That's it. But they will always show up in this order. And what are they? They're just integer divisions of the whole. Like if you take one and you divide it by one, you get one. If you take one and you divide it by two, you get one over two. If you take one and you divide it by three, you get one over three. Each one of those is each one of these peaks that you see. Look, 250, or 250. Or like, what is this, right? One quarter. It's a quarter. Two quarters. Three quarters. Four quarters. Five quarters. It's obviously not exact, but like, shit. It's just integer multiple. This is where nature gave us the integers. The answer to why, I fully don't know. I would love for somebody to be like, this is why the integers came out of everything in nature. This is why you have 10 fingers. Like, I need to, I don't know. <laughs> but they do, but these are, this is nature. Like, this is us, like, looking at the way things are. And... Yeah, it is just interesting. So the very first, if you take a note and you divide that note in perfectly in half, so you double the frequency exactly, you'll always get the same note an octave higher. That's just how, that's just how the math of this and these. these Sorry, that, that wasn't exactly my question. The, the question was more like, why does the fifth show up later as opposed to like, like I can see that you've got, you know, the first note, then you've got the octave of that note. Then you have the fifth of the note, and then you have the octave again. Yeah. I was just wondering why you first see the fifth where you see it instead of earlier in the sequence. And I was because, like, yeah. But like, note that I didn't pick the sequence, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But so the answer to why would just be that, like, because it is simply not. Like, like the fifth comes after the first octave in the harmonic series. Okay. Does that make sense? I definitely, it's, it's, it's good enough for now anyway. <laughs> and again, to remember, remember, like, how do you find these numbers? Mm -hmm. It's just integer division of the first. So, like, if this is one string and the string vibrates at 266, yep. so you just cut it in half, exactly in half, which means you would exactly double the frequency, right? Yep, and then you get it divided by three, and then you get it divided by four, five, six, seven. Okay, I guess so. Yeah, yeah and then so it just, and, and like this Ableton thing is cool because it's just telling us the notes, right? Oh, it makes sense to me now. Yeah, okay. isn't that crazy? I get it, yeah. Like, isn't that fucking crazy? Like, and yo, okay, so like, let's just go through this just a little bit more because we're just here, right? So then you get a G, and then you get another octave. Okay, sure, whatever. Then you get the fucking major third. There mm -hmm. it is. It's right there. It actually is right there. Which means that in these first one, two, three, four, five harmonics, you get the freaking major chord. But the other great thing to notice here is you see that number that's negative 51.8 decibels? So that's showing you how much energy is, is, is contained in that harmonic, right? So in this harmonic right here, I have negative 48 decibels. So it's not a lot of energy. And then when I go to this one, look at how much there is. Negative 36. And remember, too, that every single time that I go up or down a number in decibel, I'm actually changing by a factor of 10 in energy, which means that these harmonics do look like they're like actually like it contributing quite a lot of energy and they are, but look at how much more energy you get here. And here, I mean, this one again too, there's less decibels in it, but look at how much wider this peak is. And so the wider it is, the more energy that's like actually contained under it. Cause that's what these peaks are showing you is how much energy is actually contained in that part of the energy spectrum. Okay. So here we get a C, followed by a C, followed by a G, which is the fifth, followed by a C again. Then we get another, the third. Okay, so that's where the third goes, followed by the octave again. Or No, then the fifth. Wow. 
Okay. So then right here is the major chord, C, E, G. Then what do we get? Um, a B flat, which is the minor seventh. Then what do we get? A C again. Then what do we get? A D, the major second. Then what do we get? E, major third. Then what do we get? F, the perfect fourth. Then what do we get? G, the fifth. Then what do we get? A, the sixth. Then what do we get? B flat. Mm -hmm. then what do we get? B. And then what do we get? C. So I don't know if you noticed, that's the actual major scale. It's there. It's there. The major scale is there in the harmonics. It's there. It's there. So is the dominant scale. It's there. It's just sitting there in the harmonics of C. C major. Now, the truth is, is that all these harmonics, they carry not very much energy, which is why you don't hear the entire... But, like, the major scale isn't made up, although it is made up by gross Europeans. They weren't... They were... It wasn't... It wasn't out of, like, just, like... It wasn't picking something out of a hat. Exactly. Yeah. It actually comes out of what happens when you divide a tone over and over and over and over again. It literally simply comes out from that. And that's why all the piano keys get shorter. Yeah. So strange. Yeah, totally. Right? Um, or like why the strings get shorter, you mean? Yeah, because the uh, harmonic, the standing harmonic frequency of the string, is, like the string should half every octave, right? Exactly. In length. Not should, it in fact does. Yeah. Exactly half. And if you ever have a grand piano and you're bored enough, you can measure the strings an octave apart and convince yourself in true reality, like a fucking scientist, that those notes are exactly half the length. And if they weren't half the length, they simply would not sound the octave. It couldn't happen. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so we're talking about this thing, right? Like about the fifth, yeah? And like all these different notes and stuff, yeah? Okay. Uh, and so, whoops. so this is what, yeah, this is, this is what a G looks like, for example, being played by on the violin. And we're just like looking at the frequency spectrum where all the energy is. And so watch what happens. So watch what happens when I, um, when I add the, when I add another note. So I'll add the third, for example. And you can see the other, so those are the harmonics of the notes I, I added. And then these are the original notes. So the more notes that I have, you can see sort of like the more peaks show up on the spectrum. And then, so when we're talking about this idea of harmony as well, and like, how people discovered it and how notes actually work together. Okay, so this is what that G looked like. Watch what happens when I add a G an octave above. Any anything you notice there? Everything kind of gets more intense altogether. Yeah, and actually, if you look really carefully at the location of the peaks, in the one in the octave above, it, they're in the exact same place as the one the above, octave below. Like adding a note an octave below above actually doesn't change shit. They're all in the same place. Look, I'm going to move the one in octave above slightly down. See, you can see those are all in different places. You can see where the curves used to be. But then if I do an octave, they're in the same place, right? And then so now let's look at this thing with the fifth as well. So... Here I got this C note. 
And remember, this is the note that I called the fifth, right? And so if I actually play an octave, a fifth, an octave above, so right here, it's that note. And so we realize that there's this like kind of property that actually happens because sound is a wave, which is that like there's this distinct note, like it's a different note than the note we started with that we're just going to call the fifth right now. We don't really know why. And it's like fully encompassed inside of another note. Um, and so on a piano, this is kind of funny because on a piano, like, um, like, like I'm playing like a tiny little keyboard here or something. On the keyboard, I can always find, if this is a fifth above, I can always like go an octave and a fifth below and find the note that completely contains that note above it, which would be like the fifth or like the fourth below it or like the fifth. And so for that reason, we know that there's this thing in, 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 in like in, in music called the fifth, right? And like kind of that's the whole reason I wanted to go over that first half of the thing was just to like cover this idea that there's such a thing called the fifth in music. And then the next part that I really want to look at is once we admit that we know that there's the fifth, well, where can we go from there? And so what I'm going to do first, and if you guys have like a pet pad of paper or something, this is like honestly quite a good time to try to draw along to follow. No pressure, of course. Um, but... So I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself a little piano keyboard. There we go. Put a couple notes on there. And um, so we know that this fellow is called C, right? And uh, C is also right here. And also to like whatever the note name is called, it doesn't really matter that much. In this case, the thing that I want us to know is that if that was C and then this is the one that we called G, again, it doesn't matter exactly which one's which. I just want us to notice that they are, in terms of the piano keys themselves, that they are um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven notes away from each other, right? And so I'm gonna really quickly go through this and um, and uh, just write the note names on here really, really quickly. Although again, we don't need to know what they are. Like it just, it's going to help for writing this out. So there's C and then it just goes up from C, A, B, C, D, E, F to G. Where then it flips back to A, and then we go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then all the notes in between, it's either this note sharp or this note flat, right? And then I kind of like the flat, so I'm just going to stick with these for right now. So we've got D flat, B e flat, G flat, A flat, B e flat. Also, too, if anybody is like, 
uh, getting lost it for a sec. Just please let me know because I don't mind explaining any part of this. It should be something that we can do all together, even without really knowing anything about the piece. Uh, and okay, so I discovered that I have to go seven steps from here. One, two, three, four, five. Three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to get to the next note that I want to get to. And so if I started at C, and I know the next one I get to is G. Okay. Well, what happens if I go another seven steps up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then I get to D. Go up another seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Get to A. And then from A, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I get to E. From there, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I get to B. From there, I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I get to G flat. And so we notice now too that that's like the first time that I'm going to one of like the top or C. Okay. And then. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I get to D flat. Okay. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I get to A flat. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I get to E flat. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I get to D flat. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. F. Get to F. And then from F, if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm back at C. And then I know that if I started at C, if I keep going seven, I'll get back to G. And so this is kind of cool. Okay, so what we've noticed, and all we're saying here, without using notes or anything like that, is that every note contains another note it just there's another note in that note we could call that note the fifth because it actually has that relationship to that other note when we put it in the place of what we now call a scale but what we know is if you take that other note and then you get another note from that other note you can only do it 12 times until you get back to where you started isn't that kind of cool? So that's why we actually have like these 12 different notes. And it's all, it's, cause it's interesting too, right? Because we can kind of think about like, like the number 12, you'll always see it anywhere that you see cycles, patterns, like things that repeat. You, you'll like, do we notice that we see things in 12? For example, it's like 24 hours a day two groups of 12, uh, 12 months in a year. There's like 12 signs in the zodiac. Yeah, okay, 12. And also too, I just wanna say, part of the reason that we see all of these numbers, like 12 associated with like circles and circular, like circular patterns is because, of, because pi is three, you know? Like if I wanted to take this circle and I wanted to divide it into 10, or like, like I wouldn't get, I couldn't make this into 10 equally spaced notes and still have it be a circular pattern. Like, uh, like all of these circular patterns have the number three in them because they like allow you to divide a circle in, a, in an even way. And then 12 is four times three. So it's like quadrants on the circle. You know, and it's interesting too because so remember even this pattern that we use to create what we now are calling this like like our little circle here. Um, if I start here, because because remember one of the things we're saying we're doing in this all this is looking for waves. 
So look at the wave that this creates on the piano itself. So we start here, and then I go here, and then it bounces back here, and it bounces over 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 here, bounces over there, bounces over there, to get back to there. And I can follow that very same pathway backwards and trace out all of the 12 notes and how they are related to each other harmonically in this way. Um, just by like counting upwards seven. And also to just to note, um, if you want to do this, you can count downwards five. So plus seven or minus five, right? So if I start at C, if I go one, two, three, four, five, I'll get to G. Because remember, seven plus five equals 12. And there are 12. And then the last thing I really want to show you when it comes to these 12 notes again, is that like the number 12, it's cool for a bunch of reasons. One reason is that it, what numbers can you divide 12 by? 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Yeah, there's 2, and then 2 would give you 6 on the other side, and there's 3. <coughs> And then obviously one and twelve. Um, but so the cool thing is it means that if I take the number twelve, I can divide it by two, right? It should divide in two really easily. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw my piano keyboard one more time. So now what I'm gonna do actually is like you know that game where you like divide everybody into two groups? <laughs> uh, when you're kids that you never play as a dog. And how it works is you just point at one and they're in your in group and then you exclude the next one, right? And so we're just going to divide the piano into two totally different pieces. So I'm going to use red and blue. Okay. And we'll start with this note right here. And honest to God, the cool thing about this is you could start anywhere and this would work. Okay. So I'm going to include that one. I'm going to skip the next one. Okay. I'm going to include this one. And then I'm going to skip this next one. This will be the next one. Right? And then I'm going to include this one. And then I'm going to exclude the next one. This will be that one. I'm going to include this one. I'm going to exclude the next one. I'm going to include this one. I'm going to exclude the next one. And include this one, exclude the next one, and then I'm back to where I started again, right? And then at that point for the next octave, I can be sure that it's going to be like these three bottom ones that get colored in. And then these three top ones. And what's interesting is it actually leaves those white ones that are left over. It's actually just divided the 12 keys into two perfect groups of six, right? And it, like it literally doesn't matter where you start. If you just start anywhere on the keyboard and you divide them into two groups, you'll always get these two groups, always. There we go. So that's the piano divided into two equal pieces. And then the cool thing that we notice too is that those are two waves. There's one wave, right? And then here's the other wave. And 
Isn't that cool? And like, again, like, how did I do that? I'm not like using anything, like there's nothing. I'm just saying like, let's look at all the notes on the keyboard. Let's divide them into two different groups. Why are there notes on the keyboard like this? We already decided it's because all the notes have another note in them. And that if you find the note inside another note, you'll keep opening babushka dolls until you get 12. And then it'll stop. There's 12. There's actually a finite number. That's really weird, honestly. But we believe it and we see it. That's what's going on. And then if we divide the two groups into these two different colors, we get these two different color groups like this. And it's actually really crazy because like this pattern here is so fundamental to like actually what's going on in the world of what is like so-called European harmony. For example, if you start on any red note and count three red notes in a row, and then you switch to the next blue note and count four blue notes in a row, you will get six major scales. If you count any three blue notes in a row, go to a red note, and then count the next four red notes in a row, you'll get all of the rest of the major scales. So for example, like, oh yeah, because I have the laser pointer, right? You see this? So look, these three red notes right here, and then I switch to the, so I called red day. So red are day, and then blue are night. Um, all of the major scales, have one portion that's day and one portion that's night. So C major, which is all the white keys. Look, it starts, you have this portion here, the three day, and then you swap from day to night, and then you have four night in a row, and then you swap from night to day and you're back. But that even works if I might want to see F sharp, for example. I would start on F sharp, I go three red, and then I go up to blue, and then I do four blue, and then I go back to red, and that's F sharp major. So again, that's something that can be harder to discover. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's something that's like so confusing to learn in one particular way. You're like, wow, what are all these scales? You can find red and blue very easily. You separate them into two different patterns. And honestly, like if you snap, when you find these two, just smack them on the piano. Like one is that you hit this cluster of notes together, and then that four cluster, that two, that four. This one is these three, that three, these three, that three, right? They just make the two waves. See the two waves on the piano? If you play three notes from one color and four notes from the other color, you will always get a major key, always. These are, and like if you, so just being able to see the red and the blue, the day and the night, actually give you all of the patterns that are already fitted inside of what is European, like diatonic harmony. And do you see how simple this like little exercise was to play out on the keyboard? And like how many like different things we can discover in this little game that we made? Um, and in fact, one of the coolest things about this day and night thing is that if you make a melody and it's only in day, oh, I have my keyboard here. You can hear this. So this is day. And then this is night. Oops. Night. They sound exactly the same. Night. So it does not matter what note I start on. I can start on any note and just play all red ones in a row. It will always sound like that. Always. Always. Look, I'll start on any blue note. I'll just do blue in a row. Oops. And if you take one, if you take three notes from any one of them and then switch to the next one, that's what they call a major scale.
And actually, too, like, the craziest shit is, like, once I discovered this, I started using it to decode Bach and stuff like that. And, like, literally what harmonic resolution is, is going from day to night. And, like, if you just listen to Bach and go, like, day, 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 night, 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 day, night, day, night, 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 day, day, it's crazy. You're like, what the fuck? And it's, <laughs> and these are just two different, like, these two different completely symmetrical families. The coolest thing about these families is, unlike C major, C major has a root. All the notes go towards C major. The C in C major is, like, the head of the household or whatever, right? Like, everything harmonically resolves around it. In these symmetrical scales, they're symmetrical about every single note. No one note is privileged about any other note. It just can't be. You can't tell what note I started on if it's a whole tone scale, a whole tone scale, or these day-night things. You can't. But once I place them together in a particular order, all of the lesser patterns come out of them. And it's so simple to discover this on the keyboard. And it comes basically out of the harmonics inside of a single note of a violin. I was wondering if you uh, knew why they, why the like half tones in a keyboard kind of aren't more symmetrical, like why it's not six and six, like six up, six down, instead of like seven down, five up. Oh, sorry, one more time. I was wondering if you knew or had any intuition for why the keyboard isn't more symmetrical about the like top note keys and the bottom keys. Like there could be six up and six down, but there's seven down and five up. Yo, honestly, that is the deepest shit. And that's like actually what comes out of this thing that you're seeing right here. Because like if there were if the keyboard was symmetrical, then you would never be able to find your place. Right. And you wouldn't, and you wouldn't hit the fifth just like walking down no. the, the white shoes. Yeah. Right. But also, too, like one thing that I finally have really gotten past and I actually realized, like this is going to sound crazy, but I'm just going to go for it. Like I realized that the white key, black key thing is like actually this crazy European mythology shit. Like, they started doing it, and they honestly did this crazy thing to separate the white keys from the black keys. When there's, like, like if you play music, you know right away. Honest to God, no one who knows anything about a single scale could disagree. There's no difference between the white keys and the black keys. In right. fact, perceiving them separately is just going to put you in this world where you're, like, centric around C or centric around F-sharp pentatonic. Yeah. But like never actually seeing that those two things are the same thing. And if anything, that there is a difference, there's like the keys on the top and the keys on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest things too, that even in harmony, I want people to walk away with this, from this thing is realizing that there's day and night. And like day and night, the way that I've drawn them out here are actually not hierarchical. They're symmetrical patterns. And like if the keyboard were symmetrical, then day and night would look the same. And you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. And then it wouldn't work. Like, because you can tell them apart, you can see that night is the not symmetrical one and day is the symmetrical one. But it's also really interesting, too, because the, the other thing, like, remember how I said a fifth is mm -hmm. going up uh, seven semitones? Mm -hmm. um, and then a fourth is where you go down five semitones? Well, then what happens if you go up six semitones? You usually get a cranky sound. Huh? I feel like you usually get a cranky sound. Yeah, and you know what that sound is called? Is that the tritone? Yeah, it's, it's called, called the tritone. Yeah. And it's right here, right? Yeah. But look at what happens. So if I go from C and I go up six, one, two, three, four, five, six, I get to the tritone right there. Then watch what happens if I go up six again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. Back where I get you back to the same note. Mm -hmm. So all that they're saying in the tritone is is that you're dividing the thing exactly. in half, yeah. right? In perfect half. So there's one tritone. Watch, here's the next. Here's the next. And actually these whole tone scales are just collections of three tritone pairs. That's all they are.
Here's another one, two, three. Hmm. Isn't that crazy? Actually, yeah, like if you divide the keyboard into pairs, you'll get six tritone pairs that are perfectly symmetrical tritone pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they're all the two whole tone scale together. And it's interesting too, right? Because like, if you've looked at conventional harmony, like you talk about all kinds of shit in this diatonic universe, and yet we never look at the symmetries. And, and, and the craziest other part of this too that I forgot, that I almost glazed over and I'm glad I didn't, was that if I draw a circle of fifths here, now if I color in red all of the day ones, look, in order, C, D, E, G flat, A flat, B flat, back to C, in order, literally in order on the circle of fifths, skipping one at a time. G, A, B, D flat, E flat, F, back to G. So this symmetry isn't just a symmetry on the piano. It's a harmon it's a deeply fundamental harmonic symmetry. And yet, like again, too, like you could look through tons of books about music theory and they won't be like divide the keyboard into two symmetrical pieces. See if that flattens the complexity of it a little bit. And it and it does. I don't know, like, okay, because, like, in real life, I could try to gauge, like, everyone's, like, mental capacity level after this much information, but, like, what are you thinking? I was just going to say, I love this. It's great. Yeah. It's a new way of thinking about, definitely a new way of thinking about, um, like, uh, the, the notes and circle of fifths, especially, and, uh, yeah really it's gonna really help me yeah. and, the, and the cool thing about it is that even if you can't remember whatever this is you it's so easy to remember how i came up with this isn't it mm -hmm. you just pick one and then you put that one in one group and you pick one you put it in the other group and you separate it into two pieces two equal pieces by going a b a b like day night day night day night day night day night and you literally cannot screw it up you can start on, because the worst thing that'll happen is you'll call night, day, and day, night, but it literally doesn't matter. It's, I, it's totally arbitrary. The other thing, too, that I can quickly sneak in here for you guys to even try at home, if this is the kind of thing that, that you feel like might really impact the way that you're looking at things, is to, again, let's, give it, let's get our good old trusty... In keyboard back and so the last game was this game where I like divided it into into two pieces but this time I'm gonna divide it into three pieces right and like how do I do that so I color this into one and then I'm gonna skip two and then I'll get this one right Skip two, I'll get this one. Skip two, I'll get this one. Skip two, I'm back to where I started. Which means that there's one pattern there. And then again, like I'll get the, if I know I'm back to where I started, I'll get the same thing up here. And that's the skip two one, right? And that gives me that one pattern. It also gives me like if I start here, skip two, one, two, give me my loo. Skip two. And we see this other wave just emerge upon here. It just emerges. You're like, yeah, okay, I see those two waves, don't you? Don't you just see them?
And then the last one would be like the ones that are left over, which are these ones. And these are the three families in music. They're the three diminished chords. Like I could go off for hours about how you can literally figure out how to play every jazz song ever written by just knowing where these three chords are. I heard that that was something you could do and I didn't believe it. And then I learned how to do it and now I sound good at it. It's all you got to do is be able to find this. That's crazy to me. I couldn't believe it. And that's just from the skip too. And like you can bet, better believe your, your bottom, just like basically, that you could go home and you could go like this and do like a skip three. Right? If I start here. Then skip three will get me here. And then it'll also get me here. And then it'll bring me back here. Okay. So that's actually divided it. Oh. Let me just change the color so I can show. I forgot how cool this is actually. Okay, watch this. So if I skip three, I'm going to put an X there. I'm going to skip three, which will take me there. And then I'm going to skip three again, which will take me there, right? And then skip three. Okay, I'm back. Weird. And this is the skip three one, right? So remember, we did skip one. We did skip two. This is skip three. Okay, wow. That's what we get from skip three. Now I'm going to start. Uh, uh, one semitone higher, and I'm going to do the skip three again. I'm going to put a blue X. Okay. Skip three takes me there. Skip three takes me there. Skip three takes me back to there. Okay. Wow. Okay. Got another skip three. And then it goes there. Okay. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to put circles on and I'm going to start here. Skip three. Holy F. I got day and night back. That's crazy. Yeah. Like it's just there. <laughs> I got day and night back with skip three. And not only that, like all of the X's or like all of whatever fam groups these are, these are the four augmented chords. There's only four augmented chords in all of music. These are them. This is how you find them. Each of them are perfect symmetrical halves of the whole tone scales of day and night. So if you take day and night and you day and night, day and night, you'll get these. And these are just the, and what I gave you here, these are just the three most fundamental symmetrical patterns in harmony and you get them by just skipping one skipping two or skipping three and the coolest thing is is when you play these on an instrument like they won't sound like the regular chords you're used to hearing but they actually work with so much internal logic that you can understand just from the way that we built them and they're really good for working with in composition and stuff. I mean it. Like it's fun. Yeah, it's really hard to um to like relate to the people on the other side of the window. Fully. I feel like I can like imagine that it would be fun and stuff. And like I remember when I first interacted with this information, like how my mind was just so blown and like um because also too, it's like, yeah, it's just like something that comes out of reality. And we like followed the whole journey of it from reality to here. And then it's just like, so it just feels so robust. Um, but it, I, I mostly mean like I'm in my bed and it's like, it's, the vibes are so good here. Like, I don't like if you have questions or shit, like I don't even know. You, so when you said like um, the lesser patterns can come out of the, the different families or waves that we're talking about here. Um, 
Well, actually, first of all, does the fact that after you get the augmented stuff, after you get the skip three, like the X's and the O's, since you get back to day and night, does that mean that like the patterns that it ends there or like is skip well, four? What skip four? Uh, I guess it would be, uh, one, two, three, four. So from, okay. One, two, three, four. Oh, it's the same. It's the same as skip three. No, 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 that, wait. So if, if you're on, wait, let me do it with the light. Okay, so we're here. Yeah. Skip one, two, three, four. So you're there on the fourth. Oh, whoops, okay. Wait, right. can you show so skip? skip one, then you're there. Skip one, then you're there. Skip one, then you're there. If it's skip yeah, two, then you're there. Skip two, then you're there. Right. And also, too, notice that Kel quickly just about to diminish chord. You get a red X, a blue O, a red O, and a blue X, each different right. one. Right, you get one from all of them. So it's one from all of the augmented chords in the, mm. what is called the diminished chord. Mm. It's just like the, the just like the nature of these patterns are just like they're just there. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're just there to be encountered. Oh yeah, yeah. And so what happens if you do skip four is you get to the fourth, which just gives you the circle of fifths back. Mm. If you do skip six, you just get the pairs, the tritone pairs. Mm -hmm. If you do skip seven, you get the circle of fifths again. Wow. If you do skip six, you get uh, uh, the diminished, or you get the augmented chord again, but like in a roundabout way, mm. going backward. Mm. And so then, yeah, so I mean, again, does that answer the question? Like, do the patterns kind of terminate by the time we do skip three? Kind of. In mm. terms of symmetrical patterns, yeah. Right. And again, it's crazy because by skip three, we're really getting back to skip one, which means there's really only skip one and skip two. Mm -hmm. Yo, like again, like this approach, if you practice with this approach in mind, there's absolutely no form of music that could be out of your reach. And it's really just unfortunate that it's like all the enculturated practice regimens that like keep us outside of like building. I mean, those practice regimens are cool because they're also like constructed on this and like teach us how to like practice these things in a balanced way, which is the key to being able to use them. I feel like that's like one step I've like really jumped the gun on in this whole thing is like the idea of being able to use any of this for music but I feel like in a particular way like you know like you know you guys know this would make music for me so just like being able to find new ways or like really simple ways to create like a bunch of new patterns that are going to sound different than any of the patterns you've used before. Super helpful stuff, you know? And again, the other great takeaway from this is that rhythm is pitch is harmony, which means that every single thing that you play, you can hear before you play it. Whatever note you want to play, it's already in the note that's already there. And that's just a fact. And then when it comes down to the question of like how to write music or make music, like it, it's clearly just a listening exercise. Because if you listen, you'll hear it in the harmonic series. Like you'll hear the notes there. there are, they are in reality all there. And like what you're doing by picking those notes to make your melody is really just mixing those harmonics. And like one sound. This is great. Thank you, Nikki.